when I first became an administrator, I was applying for a job and was applying for assistant principal when I was teaching. And my mentor at the time, who's still my mentor to this day, her name is Kelly Wilkins, best leader I've ever had. Just absolutely incredible. As we were talking about redoing my resume, she had pointed to what's called the Alberta Principal Quality Standards, now the Alberta Leadership Standard. They, they changed the name, but the, the tenants are, are very similar to what they were when I applied for this job. And she said, when you do your uh, resume, show how you are meeting these leadership standards in your role currently, because then it will prove to people that you are already doing the job from the role that you're at. And that helped me tremendously. I ended up getting the job. I redid my, um, I redid my resume because of that. I encourage people to do that as well, to really look at what is expected of leadership when you apply for these administrative jobs and show how you're doing this all the time. But it also kind of rewired me to understand that we lead from so many different positions. And when I look at the term leadership, all I think about is this, this notion of helping people move forward in a positive direction. And if you see yourself in that space, you can lead in one component. And when we think about the notion of leaders, right? We often think of administrators, principals, but something I always believed is that you can be um, an administrator, but not a leader, but but you can also be a teacher and be one of the, the, the most important leaders in your school or district. That leadership is about having that influence to help people move forward in a positive direction. And so many people that listen to this podcast, I know that they're interested in going into administrator positions. And that's why I'm really excited about this podcast with uh, Josh Stamper. And Josh Stamper is someone I've met and interacted with uh, several times over my years in education. And he has written this new book called Aspire to Lead. You can see it in the description down below. And he talks about those steps uh, to get to that administrative position, what it actually takes. We have such a great conversation about this. But if you're a teacher and you're thinking, well, I don't want to be an administrator, a lot of the lessons that he talks about today apply to positions that you do. And understand that in these roles where you work with other people and every person listening to us does work with other people, you have that influence to lead to make a positive impact, to help people move forward in a positive direction. And so he gives some great advice. We go through uh, his book. We go through one of my old posts and kind of break it down and see his views on it. It's kind of interesting to kind of go through that. But I really hope you enjoy this episode. I really loved having the conversation. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, it's George Kuros. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And today I actually have an assistant principal who has just written a new book called Aspire to Lead. His name is Josh Stamper. And I've actually met Josh several times. I've spoke in a school district in Frisco ISD in Frisco, Texas. And I did this on our other podcast, but Frisco ISD, you are wonderful people. So got to give you a little shout out. But uh, Josh is has incredible ideas, incredible um, concepts for leadership and for those who are actually wanting to go into lead. And so I am really pumped to have you here. And uh, Josh, if you can just kind of share with everyone a little bit about who you are, your educational journey, how you got to where uh, you're doing what you're doing today. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people would love to know. Of course. So my name is Joshua Stamper. I'm an assistant principal in the North Texas area in Frisco ISD, like George said. First off, thank you for having me. Um, this is an honor. But as far as my journey goes, I was a graph designer um, when the economy crashed. I had to quickly pivot. And so I became an art teacher and a coach. And during that time, in that six year span, I had an assistant principal tap me on the shoulder and ask if I ever thought about administration. And I laughed at him because it was actually my third year in teaching, my first year coaching. And I was just trying to figure out how to become a teacher, how to become a coach. And once I realized he was serious, I came home, talked to my wife and quickly got into a master's program to become an administrator. And so through that journey is really what the book is about. Aspire to Lead is it's kind of just walking you through the different steps using Aspire um, as an acronym. So it's activate, support, persevere, identify, reflection and execution and using those words to kind of guide through stories of how I tripped up, how I failed, um, the, the pitfalls of leadership 
And over a three year span, I finally got into an uh, assistant principal role and have been doing that for the last eight years. Um, during that span as an assistant principal, I also created an, a podcast. So I'm a podcaster too, just like you, George, and it's Aspire the Leadership Development Podcast. And that kind of, that concept came from working with aspiring leaders. We had the opportunity in my last district to build an aspiring leadership program where we took folks and did sessions over the school year to help them get to the next level that they wanted to. And the district loved it so much that they actually took it away and they, they kept it themselves. And so I was longing to work with aspiring leaders. And so that's where the podcast came from. And then of course, where the book came from. Okay. So I want, I want to ask you this because I think uh, acronym, you know, titles, a lot of people think if I do a, then I'll do S <laughs> then I'll do P right. Right. So like, how do those concepts, like when you, when you think about that, it's not, I, I'm assuming, and maybe I'm wrong here. It is not a progression, but it's like, Hey, here's some like big themes, but they all kind of overlap with one another. You can't just like, you know, get all to that point. Like execution is something that goes on probably throughout and at different times and different modes. Right. So like, yes. How, like how, how do you frame that? Like when, you know, cause, cause I, I think sometimes people think like, if I just do these steps in order, I'm like, well, actually they're kind of something that you have to do all of the time and they kind of mix and match. Yeah. So in each chapter, it is a, it isn't a timeline, right. Of my right. journey. However, the concepts are highlighted in each chapter. So you're spot on. I mean, obviously like if you're reflecting at the end and you're not doing that throughout the process, right. obviously you're doing yourself and others a disservice. So, um, you are 100% correct. Um, you know, I, I just highlight different concepts that every leader needs to have. Obviously, Activate was the easy one for me. Being a assistant principal now, I get a lot of people that talk about wanting to become a leader. And then after that discussion, I never see them again throughout the year. And then right. they're always surprised, like, why didn't I move up in the position um, that I want when they didn't actually get the experience needed, especially to get that interview. So, you know, that was the, the point of really starting with Activate. But you're 100% correct. You need to be doing all these things. Like, you need support. <laughs> throughout yeah. your entire journey. Yeah, and I, th I, I think sometimes like I, when, when you're talking about this, uh, you know, a lot of people say to me, hey, like I wanna speak, I want to write a book. I'm like, okay, so like, here's where I started. I, you know, started blogging uh, in 2009. I've been doing it consistently at least two times a week since then for 12 years. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would go to the events and speak and pay my own way, not get anything. And they're like, no, 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 I just want the, like the end. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's not how that works. Right. And so I think part of it too, is I think there is, you know, in leadership and this is a, I actually wrote about this and because of a teacher, the advice that I got, or not necessarily advice, but the, 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 the lesson I learned from my, uh, phys ed coach who was also, or my phys ed teacher was also my foot coach football coach his name is calvin hobbs yeah literally his name is calvin hobbs i people don't <laughs> believe me when i say that um but he he taught me that you can be ready to lead all you want but not if no one's ready to follow you it doesn't matter right mm -hmm. and i think that that's part of it is that how are you actually you know being in that space where you're consistently you know showing up consistently trying things consistently you know pushing yourself you know, in your practice. So like, uh, so we have someone right now who's listening to this, right? Uh, who is wanting to go, um, you know, into leadership. What, what what would you say is like, hey, how do how, what is a good place for them to start? Like what 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 would you say for them to like kind of start to to kind of move into that? And I shouldn't even say leadership, because I think a lot of teachers never go into administration, and they're incredible, ap absolute leaders. Yep. And, and uh, Joe Sanfilippo always talks about this, you know, is how important it is to lead from where you are. But I think, you know, um, to be, to go into administration and be an effective leader, because I also can say on the other hand, I know some administrators who aren't great leaders, right? And you can yeah. see that with, let's be honest, government politicians, For they're sure. in roles of leadership, but they're not great leaders. So like you, you see that. So like someone who wants to go into administration, be an effective leader, what, where would you say for them to start? Yeah. So I preface in the book, like every, I think every educator is a leader because you're leading someone. Like right. if you're working with kids, you're obviously leading someone. So that I do preface that because I know that everyone that's reading is not going to be an administrator. That's, that's not going to happen. But 
if you are looking to get into admin, I would say that you need to talk with your administration right away, because if you're talking about opening doors for you to get that experience, you definitely need them to be on board and believe in the skills that you have and that you possess. Obviously, you need to get outside the four walls of your classroom and get out and experience much more. So for instance, as, a, as an art teacher, I had a lot of influence on my campus, not because of my title, but because of the, the working relationship I had with my admin. I constantly went down the front office before school, during my lunch, during my off period after school to assist, to volunteer my time, to get the experience. Because I knew at some point I was going to be sitting at the table with a lot of district leaders and they're going to ask me questions about what I had done. And I wanted to make sure that I was able to speak on the experiences and the initiatives that I took on versus just saying what I would do. So I, I think you need to make sure that you're partnering with your administration first, find a mentor, and then you need to make sure that you're taking the initiative to go knock on people's doors to ask, how can I help you? So when I, and I, I really appreciate that notion of, notion of initiative, and I actually think back to my internship, my first year of teaching. And this, I don't know if I agree with this anymore, to be honest with you, or what I did, uh, just because of what the end goal was. Sure. But I, um, I had, uh, there was like some award for like best intern, right? Or, and I don't know if you call it, is that what it's called there in, in the United States? Is it called internship? What was it like? Student teaching? Yeah, your student teaching, right? So yeah. it was like student pre-service teacher or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I actually, on the very first day, I met my teacher who was incredible. Her name was Mandy Osmond and uh, she was fantastic and very supportive. And we connected for a little while and I actually said to her, hey, my goal at the end of this is to be, is to win that first year teacher or that internship award. That is my goal, right? So in your mind, what would I have to do? What would I have to show you for, for you to give me a nomination for that. Right. Sure. And she was, I think she was a little bit thrown off that I asked that question, <laughs> but then she appreciated that I actually said this and she's like, you know, if, if to, to be really effective, here's what I need to see from you. So I asked her like, outright, what, like in your mind, what, what will you see that I can actually get to this nomination? So I'm going to be honest with you. There's like a little, like a plant, a seed in her head that this is something that I would like. But I also like, I think that if she can kind of set like here, here's what is expected of you. Um, it is to kind of go through that process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I, I didn't just try to do it. I tried to exceed everything she said. And, you know, she nominated me for that award and I didn't win it. So whatever. <laughs> and it's not like, I'm still mad about that, but whatever. But, you know, like, I, I think that it, even, in, even in the process, even in the process of that, her setting those goals for me actually made me better doing what I was doing, even though I didn't win the award. And that's why I said like, Hey, like for me, it wasn't just about doing the, like at the end of the day, if I did all the things that she asked me to do, I was actually better for kids. Now I didn't get the recognition and blah, blah, blah. And this actually makes me think, especially in the terms of leadership. Uh, when I, when I applied for an assistant principal job, I had to like redo my resume mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of fit the, what was it being asked uh, of the interview? And in Alberta, Canada, we have what's called the Alberta uh, Leadership Standard. It used to be the Principal Quality Standard. And my uh, deputy superintendent, her name's Kelly Wilkins, who I've talked about 10 million times because she's had such an impact on me. She said to me, go through the Principal Quality Standard, go through everything, and then, sh and then actually provide evidence of how you are meeting those standards in your teaching role. So show them that you can already do the job in the role that you're at. And I thought that was like, and that actually is something that I've, you know, passed on that advice to others. It's kind of like the idea of like dress to the job you want, not the yes. job you have. And you know, the, the old adage, I don't know if I knew, I don't know if that's like just dated me. Like I'm from the 1940s that I said that, but like the, the, hey, I did that as an art teacher. I dressed like an administrator. Right. Why? Because I, that was right. your, your, per, your perception of an administrator. Right. So right. Like, exactly. So, so definitely, um, uh, definitely that was super helpful is like, how do you, you know, provide evidence that in your current role, you're already leading, you're already, you know, having that space. So, you know, as you entered and became an assistant principal, like what were, what were some of the challenges that you had moving from the classroom to, to, to that role? Yeah, that's a great question because 
I, so in the district I was in, they wouldn't allow you to move up on your campus. So right. I had to go to a different campus and I went from a pretty affluent community to one that was a title one school and had a lot of different. Josh, can I interrupt you for a second? Of course. I, I just want to ask you this. Do you, do you think that I want, like, do you think that's, it was a good rule and why good or bad? I'm curious what your thought just on that rule specifically. Okay. So at the time I thought it was a bad rule. Right. Because I loved my campus. But now that I can reflect on it, I got more experience in that one year on my new campus, with right. a new set of families, a new community that still impact me today as being a better administrator that I wouldn't trade it for the world. Now, it was the toughest year of my entire career. Right. However, it was the one that I learned the most. So at the time, I thought it was dumb. <laughs> I really did. Well, I, and, I love that you <laughs> actually said like, you know, yeah. use your reflective money through that process. But but now looking back, yes, it was the best thing that could have happened to me. And the reason, and, and sorry, I'll, I'll let you finish no. with, with the rest of your answer. But I think the reason I asked this question is because I've seen that in happen in a school where somebody is like moves from teacher to assistant principal. And then there's like a little bit of like, Oh, you're in the dark side now. And like, yeah. aren't we like, don't we have the same relationship? And there, there is some different things that you have to yeah. be cognizant of because sometimes you have to have some tough conversations, not as a colleague, but as an administrator to a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you might not understand that. Uh, you know, like a lot of times people say like, well, how can you really, you know, if you don't teach anymore, how can you be an effective administrator, but then have no problem giving it advice to administrators never have done that job. There sure. is differences in the roles. Yeah. Right. And I think that, um, that you, you see that. So I was just, I was just curious about that. Cause I, 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 I know that's, I know that's not, um, I didn't know that people districts actually made that as a rule, yeah. but I know it's kind of like an unspoken rule in many places where they have the opportunity. Some smaller districts, they don't really, they don't really have the choice, right? Like, no, you yeah. kind of, you kind of go from one another. So, uh, sorry, I'll let you continue. And so like, no, you, I think you make I, a great point because I actually, you know, going through being a teacher to a leader on that campus, I actually lost a lot of friendships during that time, you know, in that yeah. span of trying to get to become an administrator because that role changed so quickly and they didn't know, okay, are you a teacher? Are you an administrator? So like I would walk into a room and then all of a sudden they would stop talking <laughs> right. and like the lunch groups got really awkward and the, you know, events afterwards of people like, Hey, do you want to come with to watch a Rangers game? You know, those invites didn't happen anymore. You know, right. like that, that dynamic already started to change wh while I was a teacher. Right. So I knew if I was an administrator on that campus, like you said, like that would even just right. go a little bit deeper. And now I'm having to evaluate and that that was a different role than what I was currently in. So I was like, okay, that I probably wouldn't be the most effective administrator if I stayed on this campus. Again, this is me reflecting well after the yeah. opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the original question. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the jump from teacher to administrator. Yes. Other than what we just talked about. Okay. So, yeah. So I went to a new campus. It was a completely different community with a lot of different um, struggles. And like Harry said, it was, it was one of the hardest years for me because the community had changed over very quickly and the staff wasn't, they did not possess the skills to help um, those students at that time. Now they're in a much better space, but it was a very much of a transition year when I was there. And so me learning the job and then having a lot of teachers not understand how to work um, and and work through their classroom to make sure the students were um, assisted with trauma-informed practices, like it was very traditional. So a lot of students were getting sent out and, and ending up in my office. And I literally had lines of students outside of my office almost the entire day. And it, it almost broke me. Like I almost walked away, not only to administration, but just in the practice alone. Um, my s wife and I were going through foster care training at the time we, we started the foster care process and thankfully we had a training on trauma-informed practices and which also kind of led into restorative practices and at that time i realized i was doing things wrong not only as a parent but also as an admin and i was suspending kids every single day um massive groups sending them back into the community and they were getting more in trouble and it was just the cycle of 
mm-hmm. of behaviors where it wasn't getting any better. And so that year I, I made just a, a goal of like changing the practices, not only for myself, but for the school. And, and I've continued to try to do that. Um, you know, now my eighth year into admin where the status quo of, of punishing and then sending students back in the class is not how I want to want to be. So, like I said, it was the toughest year, but by far it was the, the largest growth piece. And then also I started to find my identity as an administrator. So, okay. I, I'm, I'm going to go, I want you to dive into this a little bit more. Like mm-hmm. when you talk about this moving from that practice that what you were doing that you saw is not working and not being effective, what have you started and what are you currently moving to that you see as more effective in that practice? Yeah. So, I mean, we, every single day in the classroom, teachers and administrators use practices like hundreds of different interventions to make sure that we are teaching mathematics and, you know, English and whatnot. But then when it comes to behavior, we really just use three tools in our toolbox, which is typically detentions, ISS or OSS, right? In school suspension or out of school suspension. And then the student comes back and we send them back into the educational environment. And we just think magically everything's going to be mm-hmm. all right. And that they've learned their lesson where if it was a concept on math, of course, we would pre-teach, we would teach the lesson, we would have them come in for interventions, right? And then we reassess. So there's a lot of other things that occur within that, that time frame. So then the question is, well, why don't we do that for behavior? And so when I first started with the restorative practices pieces, I created a relation, relationship action team. It wasn't top down, it was, hey, here's an idea. And I really sought out like, like-minded folks that were kind of having the same struggles and knowing that there, something needed to change. And from there, it went from like six people to the end of the year to be about 40 people. And what we did was we learned together. Obviously, I was not the expert. I wanted to learn just as much as everybody else. But we dove into book studies, conversations, and trial and error, really, of, hey, I tried this. This worked. I tried this. It didn't. This is a practice that I'm keeping in my classroom. And it came to be like, um, you know, not allowing the student to just be sent away, but really honing in, like, for instance, um, uh, practices push-ins. So instead of student sending a student out, um, go to the office, it is, hey, can an administrator come here and just sit in my classroom while I have a short conversation with the student? The teacher then is still having a relationship with the student. They're able to talk through some things. Typically, it's a low-level offense that's happened in the classroom. Yeah. And then they're able to go back into the educational environment. The relationship between the teacher and the student has not been broken. The administrator now doesn't have a referral, doesn't have to bring them down the office. The student isn't losing massive amounts of time out of the class. So, you know, simple, simple practice like that changes the mindset, but then also restores or keeps the relationship between the teacher and the student. But then it's also a lesson to the student as to it's not, it's not acceptable, but you're still, still a part of this community. So, this actually reminds me, I, um, I used to ask this question as a principal in interviews mm-hmm. and, uh, I would ask this question and cause I, I had dealt, one of the things that I had dealt with, uh, and I challenged my staff was many of them wanted to know if a infraction happens, what's a consequence. If B infraction happens, what's B consequence. What if B happens twice? What's B squared, right? I'm like, oh, no, that's, that's not how it works. That's, that's yeah. not, right? Like I, I have to have a conversation, right? Like sure. I got to talk to people. I got to kind of figure out what's going on. And it was like, it was, it was, I'll be honest with you, it was frustrating. Cause I was like, what? Like, I don't know. Like how, like how, how far along the line do you want me? And it was like, there was like a handbook. I'm not even kidding. There was a handbook of like, if your kid does this, here's the punishment. And like, it was like kind of, felt like minor, minority report, like you, you need a punishment <laughs> ahead of time. So um, because of that, and because of the culture that I want to develop, I would ask this question. I would ask, uh, so the question I would ask in the interview, so you have two kids, and I would give like this situation, you have two kids, same day, same grade level, both start a fight. First time for both of them ever to start a fight. Is their consequence the same? And the answer I was looking for is like, well, 
I don't know. Cause I got to talk to the kids. I got to kind of, yeah. there's, there's more information that I need before in a situation. Right. Mm -hmm. So, because like there, there is something, there's something that's going on there and it's like really kind of dealing with it at an individual level, understanding this, but some, but some, uh, sometimes uh, it would be like, well, you know, I think because it's a fight, it's serious. There should be a suspension involved, you know, like they both, cause it's only fair, right? Only fair that they get this consequence and say, so I say, okay, so you think they both should have, so I, what if I just told you one of their parents just died? Hmm. Does anything change? Right? Like, are you still right? And it, like, like understanding that, oh, like there's some circumstances here that I don't understand. There's some things like that too. Right. And it's not like I've never given the same consequence for student A and for student B, but the similarities in what had happened was, you know, very similar and, you know, conversations. And, uh, I, 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 this might be controversial. I say this, like there was times where I suspended kids out of school because I looked at all of the factors of what was needed. And I knew the families and I went out of my way to know the families. I'm like, Hey, I think this kid needs this experience at home and to miss some time because we're trying to not just like get a, you know, a, a pound of flesh yep. for the consequence. Uh, but then I would have a kid who I'm like, if I send this kid home for two days, I, I honestly am worried about them. Yep. And so, yeah. so, so like, it was like, it, it's not like that's, that was the thing is that I tried to figure out, you know, and work with the families, try to understand sometimes, uh, like what would be the best situation for this kid to actually help them move forward and to do that. And it took a lot of time to build relationships. It took a lot of time to know these kids, which is why I always talk about, you know, I used to spend every morning. I do supervision as kids walked into school. I was out at every single recess and I, I actually said goodbye to the kids every single day. And, it, and a lot of people say, well, like, when did you get stuff done? I got so much stuff done because an hour conversation yep. turned into a five minute conversation with a kid because I already built a relationship with them and I already knew them. And a lot of kids didn't want to do stuff because like, you know, it's that whole like cliche, like I'm not mad, but I'm disappointed. Yep. Right. But you have to build a relationship where a kid actually cares if you're disappointed. Right. For sure. So, all right. So I, uh, I, I'm going to ask you this because you're an assistant principal mm -hmm. and I, I wrote this article years ago. It's actually one of my most popular articles and, uh, it is about specifically about the assistant principal. So I list four things that I think are important to being an effective assistant principal. So I'm going to tell you what I said, but I want <laughs> you to tell me, do you think it's rel relevant and how do you do it? If you do think it's relevant. Okay. Okay. All right. So the first attribute I say is that they are self-starters. Is that important? And how do you do that? I already know. I already know your answer to this one. I know. I well, already know that you think it's important. I just don't know. Yeah. Because you know my background. Yeah. So yeah. Be, well, because like, here's the deal is if you are doing your job, you should be assessing the campus and the needs of everybody. Right. So the right. community, the teachers, the um, students. So if, if you're truly assessing and you see that there's a need, which you will and should, then you better do something about it. You shouldn't be just, you know, sitting up in your office trying to ignore the problems that are occurring. So you're going to have to have an initiative that you are sitting, right? Like for the restorative practices, I didn't just sit back and say, well, this is just the system that we live in right? and be fine with that. No, better, right? you create yeah, I got to do something. So I'm going to create a relationship action team. Of course, I got the support from my principal, but you know, I took that on. The principal didn't come it was me that was leading it because i was passionate about it and that was my solution to the problem so yes you need to be a, a starter okay so and the just kind of building on that the a lot of people say like i don't want to be micromanaged but then a lot of assistant principals are like can you just tell me what to do and i'll do it and it's like well that's actually i just need i don't need you to be a mini version of me and like right. it's like the it's like the 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 dwight Shrewd <laughs> assistant to the regional manager versus assistant manager, right? right. Those are yes. very different roles. Very. So kind of thinking about that. So uh, I will give a shout out to uh, Cheryl Johnson. She was my first assistant principal. I and just I know I know she doesn't I know she doesn't listen. I uh, <laughs> she's retired and I think she doesn't. I don't know. But if she is listening, Cheryl, you're amazing. So Cheryl Johnson 
uh, worked with me, with me when I was principal. She was uh, assistant principal uh, at the same time. And I never asked her to do one thing the entire time that I was principal because she just went and did stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And I kind of, and it was just kind of like, it was so beautiful. And I, this is like the, the weirdest thing. One time he's like, she's so good at this. There was one time I was like, I don't want to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to dump this on Cheryl. I'm going to like, I'm not doing this. Like, this is where <laughs> I'm pulling the principal card. I'm dumping this thing on her. And I, I said, Hey, Cheryl, can I talk to you for a second? And she's like, yeah, yeah. Hey, there's this, uh, I know we got to do like this, uh, these assessment things. Uh, uh, can I, can I do that? I'm like, oh yeah, for sure. And I, and that was the one time I was going to ask her, she actually in the meeting, I was going to ask her, she actually jumped on it and had no idea I was going to even ask her. <laughs> she was just so incredible. She made my life so easy. She was just an incredible assistant principal and then went on to be an amazing, just incredible leader. Okay. Number two, I don't even know what I wrote here. Okay. So number two, I don't know. I know here's the title, what I wrote, determined to work towards success. Oh yeah. What does that mean? How do you do it in your job? Determined to work. Well, I mean, determined to work towards success. Hopefully, and I think this is true with educators is that you're you're trying to be the best version of yourself every single day. Mm -hmm. However, the job is hard, right? It doesn't matter where you are in the role of education, and sometimes that is lost. So, knowing your why and knowing why you're doing the job that you're doing to keep that passion, to keep that determination to move on, because I think that is lost, especially probably after the last two years that we've been in the job with. The, the changes that have occurred in just the model of education, but yeah, you have to have that determination because if you don't, then your motivation to, to be your best version or to, to find those solutions are, is going to be lost. So this, this point, and I just, I wrote really briefly, this point is out of my hatred for, Oh, we embrace failure. Oh, yeah. I, I hate it. I understand the con. I understand what is meant, but I think it just gives me something like if you, if you said like, oh, like we totally screwed up this year with your kid, but we embrace failure. <laughs> I'm like, well, that doesn't really help my kid, right? Yeah. And so it's kind of like saying, uh, AJ Giuliani talks about this, the difference between failure and failing, and he says it way better than I ever will. But it's like the idea, you know, I'm sure you know, like I've lost a lot of weight, you know, yeah. kind of went through this health process. And there's a lot of things that, you know, didn't work for me, but I learned from the process and kept moving forward until I started actually getting to the places that I wanted to be. Yep. I think when you think of failure, it's like, well, I guess that's it. We're done. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's, that's where that point came from. All right. Sure. Okay. So I know I already like, I already know that you, you do these things really well. And so like, I, I feel like I'm just giving you like softballs here. <laughs> you're okay, just like, so, you're just setting uh, it and I'm spiking at this point. I love it. Totally. Okay. So three always takes ownership when things go wrong but always gives credit when things go right. Love that. Okay. So like, that. tell me, tell me a little bit about that. What, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Well, I think it's similar to, well, you're modeling it right now, right? I mean, you're giving me a platform. You're lifting me up. I mean, that's what I think every leader should do. I mean, especially with aspiring leaders, I think you should give them the opportunity. And then when they do well, don't be dumping. Them them. Don't be dumping. Them. <laughs> you're, you're praising, you're praising everybody. Um, I think that, I think, you don't want to showboat, of course, right? You're you're not right. looking for the glory. I'm not right. looking for admin of the year or anything like that. If it happens, great, but that's not what my goal is, right? That's not the outcome. I'm I'm trying to lift everybody up as a leader. I think that comes with the culture piece too. You know, if it's all about you as a leader and you want to just receive the praise, and that's that's what it's all about. I mean, your staff is gonna realize that. Your students, you know, like everybody in your organization is gonna understand that you're there for your own accolades versus the community. So I think that's, if you're looking to create a strong culture, then you are definitely praising everybody that you possibly can that's doing a good job and not to be fake about it, but actually lift up when someone's doing the right thing. Okay. So, so like right behind you, you got a mm -hmm. Kevin Garnett, right? Is, is um, he your favorite man. player? Is he your my, favorite player? My favorite by far. Okay. So I, Kevin Garnett, pretty determined guy, right? Oh, Love yeah. him. So I, you know, I play basketball. I got my Raptor stuff in the back, all that stuff. Um, Actually, have you been to, okay, so let's just, um, I'm not going to get into basketball stuff. This is actually, uh, this hey, is do you remember, I actually, too. do you remember this first? I'm going to interrupt you. Sure. Do you remember playing basketball in Plano, Texas? And I actually played against you. Oh yeah. 
I was probably posting everybody up. <laughs> you were posting like, everybody up. I was like a hundred pounds heavier than what I was now. That's like the only thing I could do. <laughs> I was like, George Kuros is here and he actually ball. Yeah, I, I'm okay. I'm better now. You watch out. Next time I'm in Texas. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Right. So I'm going to give you a really good example of this in basketball. Okay. So always takes ownership when things go wrong, but always gives credit when things go right. Yes. So when I play basketball, I was a pretty good passer. Like I, I was a good pass. Right. And sometimes you would just give the perfect pass to a player right to yeah. someone on your team and they would screw it up and they would drop the ball and or they'd miss like an open layup and every time that happened i would go my bad yep. my bad because i know that if i'm like what are you doing like i just put it there perfectly the next time that person actually is going to be more even more hesitant right <laughs> And the one analogy I've always really appreciated when I was listening to a basketball coach, it's like someone shoots a free throw and misses. And then the coach says, Hey, don't miss the shot. <laughs> and it's like, oh yeah, no, I was trying to miss. Good right? advice, coach, what I was trying to do. So it's like, you know, you, you'd give that advice. Mm -hmm. Right. And then when you, the next time when you put the ball right where it's at and then they, and you do the perfect pass to put them in the perfect situation and they score it, it's like, that's all you, right? And it's kind of like you want to build that confidence, and that's what you should be doing, um, you know, as a, a leader. Okay, so last one. They will challenge authority. So as an assistant principal, how do you do that? Do you see that as a, something that's important? How do you how do you look at that? Well, I think it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before about your identity, right? If you're if you're doing things without questioning and you're just doing it, then I don't think that's best. For right. everybody involved including yourself because i think then you're becoming and pretending to be someone that you're not so i have challenged right. <laughs> authority when it comes to certain decisions because there are certain things that i will die on the hill for because i'm so passionate about it because i don't think it's right um now that is being said i had a very good working relationship with the principal involved and right. it wasn't like you know from day one i was coming in and saying no i don't believe in this i'm not going to do that um, obviously you need to figure out, you know, why the fence is there before you break and knock it down. So, you know, obviously you, you gotta have those relationships. You gotta do it in a way that you're communicating respectfully. You know, you're not demeaning, right. you're having those crucial conversations where you're allowing them to understand where you're coming from and why you think, you know, it may not be the best decision. And, and then of course, not just complaining, you're, you're bringing something to the table also. So we're being solution oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, that's, that's a pet peeve of mine of people bringing a lot of problems, but then right. never bringing any solutions to the right. table. So you, you don't want to be that in administration. So, um, I think, yes, it's, you want to be like, that's dumb. <laughs> right. And then walk away. Um, I think it's healthy because, you know, if, if you have a good administrative team, then you do want to be challenged. If I'm doing something that's going to be a negative for my teachers or for my students and nobody ever calls that out and just is a yes ma'am or, or a yes sir about it, then how am I better? How is my campus better? Like we do right. need to have some opportunities to push back on certain things so that we can get the best result or the best practice. All right. So this goes back to when I first got hired as assistant principal, I got an interview with uh, my soon to be principal and we actually fought. <laughs> in the interview i'm not even kidding we were like yelling at each other it was bad so i was like that was literally the worst interview i've ever had and then uh i actually got a call from him two days later and i was like gonna be like the yeah you didn't get the job and sure. i never want to see you again right and i was kind of liking it to uh you know like when we walked away it was like well it was, i had a nice time <laughs> and you know it was kind of one of those dates like that's how i thought it was going to end up like yeah nice time but i'll never see you again sure so he said i he, i would like to offer you the job i'm like are you kidding and he's like yeah he's like you're the only one who challenged me hmm. and he said basically our job my job is to do what's best for kids and i don't always get it right and if i have someone who just agrees with everything i do that's not going to be helpful it's, it's like there is e like let's not pretend there's no ego involved in this too right there is so so like he wants to do well right but he knows this and I know this, the only way he does well is if he actually does best by our students and you know, our community. So he said, do not put me in a position where you think I'm doing something wrong and you actually, um, you know, let me go out and t talk to that staff and say something and look stupid. Yep. But on the other hand, this, and this is a, I think this is important. He said, at the end of the day, I am the principal. And if something goes wrong at the school, the superintendent is not calling you, they're calling me. So I have to be at the end of the day, 
I have to be comfortable. I am accountable for the decision you made. So if you tell me and I say, Hey, we're still going in this direction. I need you to back me up yep. because you don't want to be in a role where it's like, I can play the assistant principal versus the principal. Right. And you can kind of feel that too. Sure. And so like it, that was the, actually going back to Cheryl Johnson, Cheryl Johnson was a teacher on that staff as assistant principal. Literally the first day I got in a fight with her, we got in a big argument. And two years later, when I became principal, she was, I, I said to her, I need you to, to actually apply for this assistant principal job where I'm going to be principal at, because I knew she would challenge me. And I knew that we didn't always agree on things, but I always knew her heart was in the right place. I knew she knew my heart was in the right place, but our viewpoints weren't always the same, but we'd always try to figure this out. And it, it was really good. And we, like, we had some really, you know, uh, Archie and I had like, we're like a brother, you know, became brother. We'd like yell at each other and people were like, you okay? We're like, oh yeah, like, we're good. Right. But we had that because we had that trust yes. to that conversation. I'm not saying like, go yell at your principal. Don't no. do that. But like, we had that relationship. And at the end of the day, uh, it was all about doing what's best for kids, not about what makes me feel best, you know, like just agree with me. And I think a lot of times people hire who they think is going to be like them and think yes. like them, as opposed to, I need people with the same values of what we're trying to achieve, but need different perspectives and different viewpoints. So, Hey, thanks for doing that. That was, uh, I've never done it. I was just listening. I was like, <laughs> I want to pull this up and see this. All right. So last well, thing I'm going to ask you, uh, your book aspire to lead it yeah. is released today congratulations so okay all right uh if i read this book anyone who reads this book who who should read this book and what's it going to do for them so for sure it was anyone that's a teacher that's looking to be in a leadership role and like we said before it's not about being, being an administrator that's not what it's about it's about how to make an impact and influence on campus and I figured based on all of the many mistakes that I made in that journey that I could provide that to you to see what to do as you are trying to get into that leader, leadership position. Of course, if you're a leader, I think that Aspire model, no matter where you are in your journey, still applies to you. So even if you're an assistant principal trying to get in a principal role or principal to central office, I still think the Aspire model are, is best practice to get you to that next level that you want to level up, right? So the other piece to it also, I talk about empathy, I talk about passion, I talk about creativity. Those are three things that I I think every leader should have. Obviously, as you can tell, I'm passionate about restorative practices and, and trauma-informed strategies. So that is also in the empathy uh, chapter. So, you know, I think making sure that every educator has the tools needed to get to the next level. So really I'm, I'm given a broad spectrum here for you, George, that every educator, like I said, is a leader. And I think they could be helped with this manifesto, if you will, um, to see how to kind of navigate through really a tough, tough job administration or leadership in, in school is, is it's not easy. It's not for everybody. All right. I'm going to give you this one for that. That was legitness. Yeah. <laughs> that was legitness. I and I got a shout out. I got a shout out in the book to you, George, because you actually were, was the, re you're the whole reason. No, I'm not even joking. You're the reason that I started on Twitter. I don't know if you remember this. I'm going to, I'm going to share the story if you don't mind. This was in yeah. Allen, Texas. I yeah. had just, I was a second year in my assistant principal role and we went to this big, huge theater and they set you up beautifully. It's thousands of people in here. And this yeah. guy comes up on the stage wearing cargo shorts and a t-shirt <laughs> And I'm like, okay, this is the tech. He's obviously like doing something with the microphone. Uh, and then, no, and then this guy starts to say that he's the speaker <laughs> and that he usually dresses nicer, right. but the luggage got lost. Uh, got lost. Yeah. Whole auditorium starts cracking up. <laughs> you had the room at that point. And then you continue to speak. And dude, I just, I, your story just resonated. It, like on, like I remember sitting in there, you asked the entire auditorium, like who here is on Twitter and like maybe 8% of the people right. like raise their hand. Maybe it probably was less, right. it's very little. And I couldn't even raise my hand. And so after that day, that's, that's when my social media journey and like finding a PLN started. And that's so crazy. kudos to you, man, because I, I may not be, you know, on this interview with you if, if I didn't hear you speak. Well, Hey, that, well, thank you for that. That, that really, that's, I appreciate that. Just to kind of go back to that story. Yeah. So that I lost my luggage. I, well, I didn't lose my luggage. <laughs> you didn't. I, I knew I, I put it all the places it was supposed to be. Right. Yep. And, uh, I was, uh, so I, I remember actually landing in Texas 
in Dallas and no luggage. And I was like, okay, so I'm like a pretty casual dresser. Uh, Dean Dresky, good friend of mine. He is like very anti shorts on a plane. And I'm like very pro shorts on a plane. Definitely. Right now, cargo shorts, right? Because they're not like short shorts. No. They're longer shorts, right? Yeah. So I feel like it's not like showing too much leg. So I, I, I lost the luggage, and it's like ten o'clock when I land. Yep. And uh, and then I, the only place that was open was Walmart. So I had to like have something different to wear. So I bought, you know, probably TMI. Bought some underwear, <laughs> and I remember I bought a shirt that said. I love Texas. Yeah. And that was it. It just said, I love Texas. I'm like, look, this is a Texas audience. If I have a shirt that says, I love Texas, they're not going to care. And they're they, fall in love with you. you have no idea how many people have brought up that story. Like, you, do you remember that one time <laughs> that you lost it? And actually that was the very last time that I checked the bag. I've there never checked a bag ever again. I only do carry on because of that. So you learn from the experience. I did, I did learn from the experience. All right. So thanks for doing that. I, well, and that's cool. I didn't, I didn't know you, uh, I didn't know you were there. I remember that. That was like a, that was a groundbreaking day. For, that was a big day for me. So nice. I got, a, I got a lot of, like, if you want to remember it, wear cargo shorts and a, I love Texas shirt. <laughs> it goes and it, it was awesome talking to you. I, I wish you. you all the luck, um, with the book and congrats to you and edgy match, uh, Sarah Thomas, an incredible human, uh, yes. incredible publisher. So it is awesome. And, uh, yeah, I want to give you the little, with a new book it's a big achievement i know writing a book's a lot of work and it's a little bit scary to put yourself out there it but is. thanks thanks josh and just so you know he told me i call him josh so i'm not just you that, can't that's always call me josh that's right sure. so um josh thanks so much for being on here today i wish you all the best and say hi to everyone in frisco for me because uh that that place is a very special place in my heart so I sure will. Uh, thanks everyone for listening i hope you have a wonderful day